Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to World at War Comics. My next special guest is Mr. Ryan Dross. He is the creator and writer of Stealth Hammer, which is actually about, I don't know, 10 days into your Kickstarter, maybe a little less, if I'm not mistaken, A little, little bit less, yeah. Little just less. Ju just about, we're reaching a week as of this recording. So, yeah, we still got plenty of days ahead of us, and uh, it's always a fun journey when you're doing a Kickstarter. So. Yeah, that was very nicely said, Ryan. I, I, other words that I was thinking of, but yeah, that's a good too, right? Um, but, I, you know, as I was looking, right, I think you have a $6,500 goal. You're at 35% um, toward that goal, so you're about yeah. $2,200 or so. Um, so I think that's pretty good for the first yeah. few days of the, the Kickstarter. We still got plenty of time, but as everyone knows that follows Kickstarters, you, you have that initial bump, Yes. And it just drops into a valley. And then that last yeah. five or six days, you're just hoping enough comes through, right? Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. And what we did, uh, too, is we've done two Kickstarters before uh, for issues one and issues two. Uh, this is for our third issue. However, people can still get issues one and two in this Kickstarter. So we always want to make it available for newbies and, and everything. Um, but yeah, what we did this time was there was a little bit more time in between, uh, issues two and, and doing this issues. We had some family things that happened that for both me and my artist that caused a, a delay. So during that time period, I was literally selling parts of my own comic collection and collectibles collection to pay for pages to be done ahead of time so that we could have the goal be lower than it's ever been in the past to make it more achievable. Um, it just means that much to me. To, to be able to tell this story that I'm like, you know what, I, I was looking to clear some stuff out anyways, but, uh, but yeah, just trying to accumulate enough that like, okay, how much can I pay out of pocket myself to get this story out there? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I think uh, a lot of people that haven't taken that step to create their own comic don't realize the cost that goes into it. Oh yeah. Uh, it's, it's not cheap. Um, it's, it's easier today than it ever has before. Sure. Maybe simpler to, to create your own comic book, not easy at all. It's, it's a right. lot of work, but it's yeah. simpler than it's ever been before because, you know, printers are all over the place and yep. you could do short runs and all that great stuff. But man, is it costly. And uh, I have a wife in my ear constantly telling me <laughs> your hobby is ridiculous. <laughs> it makes no money. You call it a business, but businesses usually have some kind of profitability. Right point right so right i, I feel well, like and that's the thing that's the thing too like and and like just to uh, let people know like i make zero money from from this so the the goal really is to pay for my creative team uh, i do believe in paying uh artists and everything else what they're worth and uh i've got some amazing talent working on this and we'll, we'll talk about some of that um but also uh like you said the printing and then there's of course the Kickstarter takes their fee chunk out and like there's things like that too. So you try to account for all that and shipping and everything. And it's just like, and there still ends up being money coming out of your own pocket, <laughs> which is fine. Like I said, for me, it's about getting that story out there for people. But like you said, there's so much that goes into creating a comic that people just don't realize. I didn't realize some of this stuff until I got in into actually creating it. Like I knew there was a, I knew there was the, you know, the artist. I knew there was the colorist. I knew there was the letter uh, and printing and everything else. I never knew about a flatter. Uh, a flatter is someone who kind of sets up the panels and everything else for the colorist. And I was like, well, this is something new and interesting to learn about. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was a interesting journey making the first issue. Uh, it always seems like every issue has its hurdles, its own challenges and everything else. Um, we've gone through four colorists wow. since issue one. Uh, and it's just because it's, it's a one-off project for a lot of people. So like, if you reach out to a colorist that you like working with, it's not that they don't want to work on it again. It's that they have other existing gigs that are going on. So, um, with issue two, we had, uh, a very well-known colorist named Chris Sotomayor. Uh, he, I know him through a few people and I asked him if he'd be willing to, to color issue two. And he said, yes. And then he colored the cover and he colored four pages for the Kickstarter. And then when it came time and we actually reached the uh the goal and everything else i reached out to him and he was just too overwhelmed with work and he couldn't finish and then it was a challenge of like okay who can i get and found uh this amazing colorist Louis delgado who worked on uh the uh, last ronin uh tmnt last ronin and he worked on a few other things and he was like yeah i'll do it and he finished the issue off for us and did an amazing job and then of course i went into this issue and was like reached out to him again. He's like, I, I have 33 projects I'm working on right now. <laughs> He's like, I don't have time, unfortunately. 
but then we found another amazing colorist. Her name's uh, Heather Breckel, and she's worked on like My Little Pony and Rise of the TMNT and things like that. So, um, so it, it's an interesting journey. And I always get people all the time like, "How did you get this person? How did you get that person?" Like Dave Sharp is our has been our letter. Uh, he'll be our letter for this issue as well. He's a veteran in the industry in lettering. Uh, he's done tons of work. And I've had people go like, how did you get Dave Sharp? I'm like, I emailed him and asked him. <laughs> sometimes it's that easy, right? It is. It <laughs> is. <laughs> Not often, and, but sometimes. Right. And people get very flattered. Like, even if they can't do something like uh, for you, they, you know, the, a lot of the variant cover artists and stuff like that, I've reached out to different people and they're like, I love this. This looks great. I don't have the room for it right now. Um, so, you know, you move on to the, the next person and everything else. And I've, I've gotten been very fortunate to work with some amazing like variant cover artists and, and everything else and it literally is asking them and be willing to pay them of course <laughs> so that's the big thing you always open with this is a paid gig <laughs> exactly. and i will be on time and all that other good stuff yeah exactly, exactly. unfortunately uh you know especially in the world of independence that's the other thing that kind of i have found works against an independent creator is when you do have a colorist that you want to go after or an artist, just them believing that you're going to finish the entire project, yeah. right? Yeah. And they're going to get paid because, you know, it, it is tough, right? And, yep. and a lot of times you're putting your own money up front and there's obstacles after obstacles, or you have this, you know, 40 day pause during a Kickstarter to see if you're going to have the right. funding. So then right. the artist is kind of like, well, are you, am I going to get used or not? Well, if we fund, we will, right? So, right, right. So many factors. It's just, yeah. A lot of things against us for sure. Yeah. And I never ask an artist to do anything unless I know I have the money to pay them. Exactly. So it's That's like smart. every every art piece of artwork you see on the Kickstarter for this issue has that creator has been paid for their artwork um, out of my own pocket. But it's like, again, it's important to me. And I want to be able to show people here's what you're getting and here's here's what it is. And um, yeah, the, the, and the talent I've had to work with is just unreal. So it's like some of the names I mentioned, I like, I mentioned Chris on my or for people that don't know him, he's worked on like Batman and Spider-Man and like Crazy. all these, all the big names that you can imagine. Uh, our first issue was, uh, colored by Ross Hughes, who has worked on like Green Lantern and Justice League. And I mean, it's just like, again, it was just like contacts through other people that knew other people. And then. It's like, would you like to do this? Would you be interested in doing this? And um, and thankfully, people have said yes. So that's so cool, Ryan. Well, you know, I'd love to open up the Kickstarter. But before we get into that, maybe we could learn a little bit more about you. This passion sure. about comic books, yeah. And when it started, and then yes. when did the story of Stealth Hammer begin? Yeah. Um, and uh, how far out have you been? Kind of building out this story, like sure. all the goods, man. Yeah, kind of a yeah. In the tent, Ryan. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as far as my comic history, uh, I, uh, I'm i a child of the 80s. So I was five years old when the 80s started and 15 when it ended. So I always felt like, you know, uh, Kenner and stuff like that probably had a file with my name on it saying, if we make toys for this guy, they'll be very popular. Uh, so <laughs> it was the perfect age. So I grew up with all the, you know, the awesome 80s properties of G.I. Joe Transformers and then also growing up with stuff, uh, influences like uh, Jim Henson stuff and everything like that. So like that's one of my heroes is he created an amazing worlds with like Dark Crystal and Labyrinth and Muppets and all that type of stuff. Um, so those were like all my inspirations growing up. And I wasn't really heavy into comics as a kid, as a little kid. I had a few comics here and there. My first comic was uh, the first issue of Return of the Jedi. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Um, and so like that cover is imprinted in my head. It was a purple cover with uh, Luke and Leia and Lando from the Java scene on it and everything. So, um, and then uh, getting into like late eighties, early nineties, I was able to like ride my bike up to the local comic shop. Um, and I, I like telling this story, but I also don't like telling this story because it doesn't show my intelligence very well as a little kid. But the comic shop was called L.A. Comics. And in my mind as a kid, I was like, oh, these are comics from the West Coast. Uh, they're comics I wouldn't get here on the East Coast and so that. And it was probably like the guy's name was probably like Larry Anderson Comics or something like that. <laughs> so, but, uh, but I was very excited to like ride my bike up there. Uh, started picking up uh, Green Lantern uh, comics because Green Lantern from the Super Friends was my favorite character. Uh, and then I got to learn more about him in the comics. He's still to this day my favorite character in all of comics. Um, 
start picking up uh, stuff like the Midnight Suns. So I love that supernatural type stuff. Uh, the 90s X-Men cartoon was out. So I started picking up the X-Men, like right around the Muir Island saga. So right before you got adjective lists that broke all the records and all that. So, um, so yeah, I was just collecting. And then it's like one of those things I never looked back and have a ridiculous collection now. Um, <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, just loved all that type of stuff. And then going into, you know, fast forwarding to actually um, many years later, I started doing a podcast uh, uh, called Star Joes, which was star for Star Wars and Joes for G.I. Joe. And and we said it was like, and everything in between. Yeah. Um, so we covered all these 1980s properties that I was mentioning. And uh, the comics were starting to become very popular. IDW was having a lot of issues come out and everything else. And we started having people on the show that were working on those comics. And some of them are now like very close friends of mine, some of these artists and, and writers and stuff like that. And that's, and, and I'm sure you've experienced this too. It's like one of those things where the side benefit of doing a show is the friendships that you make that you just don't expect that to happen. That's that, that's not why you started. You weren't like, Oh, I'm going to go make friends by doing this. Like, but that's the best benefit that came out of it. So um, so I started making all these contacts and everything else. And it literally like starting the podcast was one of those things where I was like listening to podcasts and going like, well, I want to do a podcast and then just finding out what was involved with, uh, doing a comic. It was kind of something similar where I was like, I have a, this story I want to tell. Okay. How do I do this? And started reaching out to those contacts that I had like, okay, how do I go about doing this and, and making a comic and everything? Um, so Stealth Hammer itself, the inspiration for that uh, is always a humorous thing, which is uh, Stealth Hammer is the real life nickname of my wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> and not for any bad reasons. <laughs> uh, so she she's a graphic designer. She worked at uh, an ad agency and uh, her boss had submitted multiple ideas to a client and uh, she's like, can I submit an idea? I have an idea for something. He's like, sure. So she submitted it and the client chose her idea. So the next time the boss sent something out for people to submit ideas, he's like, watch out for stealth. <laughs> and so that became her nickname for a while was stealth. And then she worked at another place where she was in charge of brand compliance. So she was in charge of making sure that the right colors were used, the right font, all, you know, all the little details were done right. And so her boss was like, you're the one that has to lay the hammer down. So I'm going to call you hammer. And she's like, I already have a nickname. So then she's put the two together and she became <laughs> self hammer. Uh, and that's been her nickname ever since. And like, we would always joke about how like, oh, that's a cool sounding superhero name. For sure. um, so we would talk about like, what would self hammer's powers be? And what, you know, all what's her origin and all that type of stuff. And then a few years ago, I had her drawn. I commissioned an artist at Baltimore Comic Con to draw her as a superhero for her birthday. And uh, I gave him some ideas of what, you know, I sent, gave him a picture of her and also gave a couple ideas of what I had in mind. And once he drew that, um, he instantly, it was like, uh, oh my God, maybe there's actually something here. You know, maybe, maybe this is actually a real idea that we could do something with. Um, and we do have a website, uh, stealthhammer.com. You can actually see that original photo on, on the website, which is very cool for people to see and, and read, read that story. But, uh, I'm, we're down in Florida for a trip for her birthday. It was a special birthday. So we like made a vacation out of it and everything else. And I give her the, the drawing and she absolutely loved it. Um, and then we were talking on the way to like, we we're going to like a shopping plaza or something like that. One of the outlet malls down in Florida. And uh, we were talking about it and I was like, maybe this actually could be something. I don't know. Like, and as soon as I thought that, I had ideas flooding in my head. And I related to this, although not at the same level. I'm not putting myself at the same level as this person. But there's the uh, the story out there that Paul McCartney woke up one day and had the song Yesterday in his head. And he wrote it out in like 15 minutes. It was kind of like that. It's like, as soon as I decided, okay, we're going to do this story, I could not jot down the ideas. I'm in the middle of a shopping plaza with my phone out and notepad open and just writing down the ideas as, as I could think of them. Yeah. Um, and every idea I had made it into the comic except for one. There was just like one little thing I had her have like a chameleon pet or something like that along with she had a pet dog. And that was just like a little too much. I couldn't make it work in the story. And I was just like, okay, well, but everything else that I wrote down that day is in this comic. <laughs> That's cool, man.
<laughs> now, what did your wife think of the storyline when she first heard the storyline, knowing that it was named after her? <laughs> she loved it. I mean, it's yeah. like one of those things where she's just like, I made her a superhero. I was like, yeah. how do you how do you get mad at that? Um, but yeah, no, she she absolutely loved it. Like the characters named after her. And that's one of the things too. Like, I'm not someone I I'm not a fan of like self-insert characters. Like you can always tell when it's like forced and everything else. But I am a fan of when it's uh, a character inspired by things in people's lives. Um, and it, you, I've often said, I've actually done presentations about comic books and everything else. And it's like, I always say, you write what you know. And like, so whether it's experiences or stuff that you're interested in or things in your life, you like, you write those things because you know them well. And so like, the character's inspired by my wife, but she's very different from my wife in some respects, but there's certain personality, uh, you know, things that I've pulled from, from her that plays into it. Um, the character's main tagline is that's not how the story ends. It's kind of like a don't give up uh, type of tagline. That's a literally a, a line my wife has used in life. Oh, wow. uh, so like I pulled stuff like that to into the character. Um, she has a, a pet dog I mentioned uh, named Hannah. That was uh, that was our real life dog. Uh, she had passed away a few years ago, and to like immortalize her, I put her as the pet in the story, and it just it worked for the story. And everything for me is about the story. So if it doesn't work for the story, it doesn't go in there. It doesn't matter like what type of reference it might be or what if it'd be something fun for us. I want to write a story that people enjoy and can have have a smile on their face. It's one of the reasons I made it all ages. Yeah, it's because I I want anyone of any age to like be able to pick this up and have fun with it. And I wanted to tell us an all ages story, like the all ages I grew up with, Yeah, you know, like that was one thing my wife did say. So there's a character in the story named Marzana and she's the Polish deity of death, mm. which is not something you would picture in an all ages comic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my wife saw the drawing of her and she's just like, she's kind of creepy. And she goes, I thought you're doing an all ages comic. I go, I am, but I'm doing the all ages comic that I grew up with, which is it's okay if, some images still give you nightmares as a kid. <laughs> We're just not going blood and guts and all that type of stuff. But uh, but yeah, if something looks creepy, that's okay. Like, God, again, thinking of Dark Crystal, that whole movie is <laughs> is creepy, but it's still all ages. It still yeah. is meant for kids. So, um, so we have moments like that. But um, but yeah, I wanted to incorporate things that I love. Like, I love superheroes, so this character is superhero. But I call it a superhero adventure because it's not like oh, she's patrolling the city and fighting bad guys it's she's on that hero's quest um and uh and then i i love crazy sci-fi stuff and i love mythologies of the world and, and things like that so again it just kind of worked that all these things work together in the story that i was telling um so i i describe it as a superhero adventure set in a world of high-tech gadgetry supernatural mythology and to relate it for people it's like star girl in a world of mega man meets jim henson's creature shop so <laughs> you have to sit on that for a second and then it makes yeah, fun to sit. yeah. <laughs> that's awesome ryan man hey, you know i'm unfortunately i'm kind of new uh to stealth hammer so going through your kickstarter um definitely worth backing if anybody's watching this i cannot wait i, I did back and i'm getting one and two so i could get into the yeah. story um it looks absolutely amazing the art is incredible it's vibrant in different colors i mean really great job on everything i thought maybe we could take this time maybe to walk through the kickstarter i'll share yeah. the screen and let's take yeah. a look and that way people could check it out and we'll make sure all the right links are below that way yeah. uh, everyone has the ability to jump in so yeah uh, absolutely uh, let's do this I appreciate the backing too. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I've already watched the video, so it's not yeah. shooting the video, but there is a video <laughs> here. Um, but you are at thirty five percent to goal, which I think is uh pretty good. What well, we're six days in, I assume this yeah. is thirty day, thirty one days, right? Yep, yep, thirty days. Yep. So yes. yeah, we're six six days in, doing pretty good. Good, good start to it. Um, and I will highly encourage people only because of the amount of time that I went into it. Uh, that when you go to the site. If you do nothing else, I mean, I want you to back it, but if you do nothing else, watch the video. It's a one minute video. Um, and the reason I say that is because I spent, I think, eight to nine hours to make one a one minute video. But I am so proud of it because it's just it's just a fun video to watch. And it gives you an idea of like like you were saying, the the uh, the uh, artwork, the colors, the story. It gives that type of feel to it. So 100 percent, 100 percent. I couldn't agree more. I will right, we'll kind of jump into here. You kind of gave us a little bit of a synopsis of the story. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add. 
Um, yeah, I would say so. Issue one is uh, is her origin, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's really like a uh, I it's like a throwback to golden age type storytelling where you get the hero, she gets her power, she fights a bad guy, end of story. Um, and but there's little little hints in in there of different things. Uh, one of the big things for me is I kind of refer to my writing a little bit as like Claremontian, where like Chris Claremont was always known for like throwing things into the story that he would then revisit later. Uh, so I do a lot of that, like uh, in the very first issue on the very first page, you see her in her room and there's just like tons of stuff in the room. And I can tell you for a fact, everything in that room means something oh. uh, for a future story, which is really fun. So yeah, so the first issue was her origin. Second issue is her legacy. And that was the fun thing with the second issue was um, we got to show that she this she's part of a family legacy of protectors. So we we really open it up. So you go from this golden age style story into like, okay, here's the real world that you're about to jump into. And it's and I've had so many people that have read it and said, I did not expect the story to go in that direction, but I'm so glad it did. Yeah. Um, so now we're going into the third issue. And the fun thing with the third issue is it's a, a flashback issue. So we have Ari the Elf that we just saw. He's We had some fun with the, the cover for this one, which is him fighting some wrestlers. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that one right here, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so those characters are actually in the issue. Uh, right. It's not exactly a wrestling match that you see happen, but he does fight them. Uh, and it, it, it's just kind of fun. So we decided on the cover to play around with it, make it actually like a wrestling match. But yeah. Um, but yeah, we're seeing everything from Ari the Elf's perspective. And Ari the Elf is like the sidekick mentor type. He's like my Yoda type character. Um, he's a little snarky and everything else. But he's been sent on a mission to go and get, make sure that stuff that Jamie, the character, gets uh, her powers to become this hero that she's meant to be. And this is the story of his start from his journey to where we left off in issue two. Um, so it's a flashback from his perspective. So we're going to see people are going to be able to see things that happen in issue one, issue two from a different perspective, a little bit more comical perspective because Ari is a fun character to write. Um, and it's it's a little bit of a payoff of those things I was mentioning where it's like, OK, we have hints of this. We have hints of that. Like in issue two, there is a scene in a police station where we see like this uh, student of this uh, judo student of Jamie's. Uh, it finds herself in uh she's talking to a police officer and she's like i'm telling you like this gnome guy came out of nowhere and we were fighting these, these guys and everything else in this issue we get to actually see that scene that she's describing so it's like little fun nods like that so um but yeah if you want to scroll down we can also see some of the crazy artwork uh that my artist joel jackson look at that yeah. he, he's in columbus this is page one of the third issue we all we open up every single issue with like these big splash pages and they're insane. I mean, they're just like there's no better way to describe it. Yeah, the D, I mean, it's like a Where's Waldo page, man. There's it just is. so much going on here. You could probably spend a half hour just trying to figure out everything that's been added to this page, but the detail yeah. is absolutely insane. Yeah, and and this takes place in Iceland, so it's uh it's during a time period when they have mostly night. Yeah. Uh, it's this elf village, and like you said, there's just there's so much going on. There's so much detail, and that was very important to me when I was trying to find an artist. I wanted someone to have this cartoony style for all ages, but I wanted someone that like could be super detailed because I knew I was going to be putting stuff like in the backgrounds and everything else. And sometimes I'm giving Joel like super detailed pages, saying like here's everything I want in this page and mm -hmm. and why. And sometimes it's literally just saying like, okay, it's an elf village and we have Hallie the fairy flying through it. And then he comes up with this. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, man. That is awesome, man. What incredible yeah. detail. And like you said, even the colors, everything about this page looks amazing to me. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Um, yeah. That's Heather cool. Breckel, she did an amazing job with the colors and just kind of making the things pop that need to pop. And like you said, also giving some details to the things in the background. So like you could literally look at the page for, you know, an hour and still find stuff that you didn't see the first time. So, so cool, man. So cool. And then we see Ari uh, being sent on his mission. Uh, he is, this is his ceremony. He meets the goddess Aurora, uh, which there's a whole storyline behind her. And uh, in my world, the uh, female Fairies are the warriors. They're like the Amazon type uh, characters. And then the male fairies are the magic users. So we have one of the magic users at the top there. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah, it really is a matter of like fleshing out a whole world before you ever start writing that first script. I mean, it's just like there's so much that was planned out before we ever started even issue one. So, well, let's talk a little bit about that, Ryan. Um, what was the part about creating this more enjoyable? being in the mall and being on the write down kind of a detailed story of how you're going to like it or the world building that went around it probably happened maybe a little bit later as you yeah. dug the character more and more world building probably is taking place. Is there one that you kind of prefer over the other or is it just all part of that enjoyment? I, I think it's all part of it. Like I love creating characters, but then I love figuring out how do they work for the story and how do they, how do they fit into that world? And I absolutely love world world building. Like, I grew up uh, reading Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland and Wizard of Oz and like all these things where it's like, and I still love those stories to this day of like, just you start small with like a few characters and then you just kind of keep building on that and growing it and everything else um, until you have this whole mythos going on for you. Um, but then there's things that happen like kind of, uh, and this is part of that collaborative process that when you're working with an artist or working with other people, where things kind of happen, you get inspired by something and then you're like, oh, wait, that'll work really well for the story. So a couple examples of that is um, Joel, uh, there's a character named uh, Dr. Everett, which is Stealth Hammer's father. Mm -hmm. And Joel was drawing him in, in his style and everything. And he put a little robot sitting on his shoulder. And he, I was like, oh, I like that robot on there. And he goes, yeah, I thought he'd have like, he's so busy and he's kind of absent minded. So he's he would have these little assistants that help him. And I was like, oh yeah, go with that. I like that. So then he draws the cover to issue one and there's eight robots, uh, eight, eight of these little assistants on there. And I texted him and I was like, Joel, you know, with me being the writer and creating this whole world and everything, I have to now come up with names for all eight of these characters. <laughs> I have to come up with personalities for all of them. I have to figure out how they're going to fit into the story. So, like But it, it worked so well because it was new characters that I, got, that I got to play with and it made sense for the story. Uh, another example was uh, where you, the craziest thing where you can get inspired for things. Um, so we have our Facebook fan page out there. And uh, my wife's name is Jamie, J-A-M-I, just an I at the end, no E. So we were at 99 people following the page. And when we reached the 100th person, person's name was something like uh, Lainey, like L-A-N-I. -L -A so just another I at the end. And I was like, oh, you'll never believe the, per the 100th person to like the page also spells her name with just an I at the end. My wife's like, oh, that's that's kind of funny coincidence. And then the 101st person, minutes later, also had a name where it just spelled it with an I at the end of it. <laughs> and my wife goes, oh, it's like the clan of the eyes. And as soon as my wife said the clan of the eyes, <laughs> I started to get inspired. I'm like, oh, what if like there was like an, as another opponent, there was like this magical cult that was the clan of the eyes. And they sacrifice their eyes into these little bat creatures. And that's how they can use their magic. And they're trying to bring their lord, uh, their creature lord from another dimension over. And he's got like all these eyeballs on these tentacles and everything else. And my wife turned to me and she goes, did you just come up with all of that like now? <laughs> <laughs> she goes, from me saying clan of the eyes? I go, yeah. And in issue two, there's actually a pinup page because we each issue we put like Joel does these pinup pages that are supposed to be like the further adventures of Stealth Hammer. Yeah. And he he did a pinup page of, of Stealth Hammer and Ari fighting the Clan of the Eyes. <laughs> um, so, and, and they appear in a double page spread in the, in the second uh, issue as well. So you just never know where you're going to get inspired by something. <laughs> <laughs> be ready at all times, right? <laughs> right. Incredible, man. This one is awesome, man. I don't know if it's just the colors. Yeah. Um, this page really pops, man. Yeah, so what we did here is uh, Ari's coming over to the U.S. Uh, he's on his mission. He's been given his marching orders um, of what he has to do from the goddess. And he's used, he stole some magic. He stole a magic bag from one of the fairies, and he's using the magic. And when I was thinking about, like, okay, do I create magic words? Like, how do I get him to use magic? And so I, I literally would, what I did was, I was like, well, he comes from Iceland. What if the magic words are just the Icelandic language? Well, like... So I took words that I wanted them to use and just tran went to Google Translate and translated those words into Icelandic. And that's his, that's how he uses his magic words. That's uh, cool, 
probably making it very difficult for my letterer, but because <laughs> they have some weird symbols and know. everything After else. After that but... first page we uh, looked at, <laughs> you're making it difficult for your artist as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's all on him. He does that okay, on, okay. His, on his <laughs> fair own. Enough. Fair <laughs> enough, fair enough, Ryan. But yeah, I, but awesome. yeah, I, I love the breaking of the pan. I love breaking the panel there and everything else. It's just, yeah, it is a fun page, so. Very much so, very much so. So and then we get into the characters, kind of introduce them yeah. into, you know, introducing the, uh, somebody that's new to it, to some of the characters, who they are. Jamie Taylor's Stealth Hammer. We have Ari the Elf. We have Dr. Everett. We have uh, uh, the goddess Aurora. So just kind of introducing a few characters so people kind of know uh, personality-wise. So, And then we have the amazing creative team. Uh, so uh, we have myself there. Uh, and then my wife is right next to me there. She is on the creative team, not just because she's the inspiration, but she is a graphic designer. She actually did the logo and the title image. She nice. does the credits page for us. Uh, she helps me with all the PR work, uh, creating stuff that we can post on social media and stuff like that. It's like she's very much involved with the whole process and, and the creation of every single issue. So she helps the title, uh, the covers look like how, how they're supposed to look with, you know. Uh, all that. And then Joel Jackson's the next one on there. That's the artist that draws the insane pages that you saw. Uh, <laughs> and then Heather Breckel is the colorist who I feel bad for because she has to color all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> she did and a then good we job, have, man. That was awesome. Oh, yeah. And then uh, Dave Sharp is our letterer. Uh, and then Chris Uminga, uh, we'll see some of his work a little bit further down, but he is the variant cover artist for this one. Uh, so we first issue, we had Robert Atkins, who is a good friend of mine now, uh, He's one of the people I had on the podcast and he worked on like G.I. Joe, a couple issues of Spider-Man. I think he did Villains for Hire for a while and stuff like that. Um, he did the variant cover for issue one for me. Uh, issue two was Chrissy Zulo, um, who I've been a longtime fan of hers. She's done uh, DC statues uh, and then she's uh, Marvel did a whole bunch of variant covers of hers uh, a lot lately. I got her right before marvel started having her do covers like literally she said nice. yes and she did it and then all of a sudden i started seeing like solicits for marvel covers of hers um so she was one that people said how'd you get her i was like i just happened to get her right before marvel did don't worry <laughs> <laughs> um, and chris blew up right <laughs> yes exactly and then chris aminga is her husband um and i love his artwork too he's done uh, he's also had statues done of his artwork for DC, but he's also done a lot of stuff for Disney um, for uh, for various things for them. And then uh, last but certainly not least is Brian Shearer. And every uh, issue, I love filling an issue with as much artwork and uh, story as possible. So even the back cover has artwork on it. And I always have an artist that does the back cover. And Brian Shearer has worked on Transformers and G.I. Joe. And he's someone I've known for a while. And I was like, would you be willing to do uh, 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 the back cover for me. And he, he has his own projects. He's on William the last that was through American goth, uh, American mythology. Um, he's also, uh, has his own project called, uh, gunship thunder punch. It's kind of like a Gundam style, uh, type story. So, but he's got awesome artwork as well. And we'll see, uh, his back cover, but I, like I said, cover to cover, I want to put as much artwork and as much fun into an issue for people. So that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Yep. So here's a breakdown of each of them right here. Yep. And then there's uh, Chris's cover, uh, variant cover, which is just so much fun. Uh, it's Ari going on his adventure and uh, just, cool he put, too. yeah, just puts a lot of fun in, into it. And then Brian, Brian did, uh, this is what the back cover will look like. So it'll be, it's just this, that hero type shot of Stealth Hammer. So, so cool. And for people that are curious what her powers are, she is a, uh, so she has, fists like sledgehammers and she gets those like magical swirls around them and everything uh before she uses them and she can turn invisible so you have the hammer and you have the stealth <laughs> so... <laughs> very good <laughs> all right when i when i heard the i read um you sent me kind of a quick bio and email before and yeah you were talking about your wife and how it was named after her. And it was a little intimidating to, to hear of a woman whose uh, nickname is stealth. Hammer. Like, wow, you're a I know people, man, people or I baby. know, you know, bleep twice. If you're in trouble, Ryan, you know, <laughs> people always are just like, Oh, and I'm like, no, let me explain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, I'm glad you explained it. <laughs> it. It's nothing that puts me in any type of danger. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, no, we've been married. We've been married 22 years. This, this year will be 23 years. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's just fun. We just yeah. have a good time. And she's not into comics at all. 
she yeah. just is very she's super supportive of of like this is my hobby and this is what i enjoy and this lets her be a part of it and she just she has had a blast creating stuff so awesome yeah congratulations that's amazing thank you um but yeah going into some of the uh just some of the rewards that people can get uh we like i said we do have all three issues uh will be available so if you never uh backed it before you can you can get uh the entire uh issues one two and three um you can also do if you really want to get adventurous and you want all three issues you can do the mega pack which is the mega combo pack which is where you will get all of the covers all of the mini prints all of the bookmarks and stickers and everything that we've done for all three issues um all of it is in there and you save a little bit of a little bit of money on it too um and then uh, if you scroll down a little bit on the uh, main page there, oh, so wow. this is just the pencil work uh, right now, but this is for the Epic Battle Pack, uh, which is going to be a limited print only available for this Kickstarter. There'll be 50 of them made and then they'll never be made again, which makes me excited, but also makes me a little sad because you thought Joel went crazy in the pages of the issue. Yeah. I I told him, okay, here's all the heroes and here's all the villains. And I want this to be like this epic last battle in case we, in case for some reason we never get to that in the issues, which we will at some point. But, and there is this end story to our end point of my story too. So like, this isn't just an ongoing forever. Yeah. Um, but I was like, here's what I want. I want the heroes and the villains squaring off each other and going at each other i said kind of like at the end of rocky three when rocky and apollo go to take that swing and you get that freeze frame yeah <laughs> i was like that's what i want i want that feel like this is all about to go down and he went nuts <laughs> it it's crazy. It's, it's hard crazy. to see here and and i've already talked with my colorist about it i was like because it's gonna be fully colored oh wow they're they're gonna yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be 11 by 17 so it's gonna be a nice big size image you're gonna be able to see everything very well they're gonna be numbered so, uh, for that limited run and then they'll, they'll be signed by both me and joel uh so so it's a it's an exclusive print with this amazing battle scene um, I will say that there'll be actually 51 of them produced because there'll be 50 of them produced for the limited print. And then there'll be one extra one made for the person who also the, the ultimate high dollar amount is you can get the original artwork for this if you oh, wanted it. Wow. So there'll be one print. Of course, you'll get the print along with the original artwork. So um, it'll be fully inked and everything by Joel. Uh, but yeah, it's it's absolutely amazing. And then if you like Joel's artwork and you're like, but I would like some him to draw something for me, we do have it uh, in the Be an Original uh, or Customize Your Hero reward. Yeah. You can uh, have him draw any character you want. Oh, uh, he, nice. there's, ten, there's 10 of them out there uh, available and he he will draw any character you would like. I've had, we've had so many different things. You can see there we've had Frozen, we've had um uh mandalorian and then the last one there was a friend of his was in a band and wanted him to draw him in you know performing so he drew him performing <laughs> as like a one-man band so um so there, there's no limit to what joel will uh, be able to draw for you if you want something like that and like that i said that's cool. in the customize a hero and really when you when you, if you've ever been to con conventions like 125 to get a custom uh commission piece plus yeah. the comics like you're getting the combo pack comics and everything so you're getting both covers you're getting the bookmarks you're getting the prints and everything plus getting something drawn by him uh we felt like that was a really good price uh for people to get something like that Agreed. um yeah and then we have a uh, original artwork this time which we've never had before so joel works in digital he draws <laughs> digital artwork um but because this was a throwback story it was a flashback style story he said I'm going to draw this by hand. So he is actually hand drawing every single page this time. Um, he wants to keep some of them for him, uh, a lot of the story for himself, for his portfolio and things like that. But he he has allowed for there to be five pages uh, of his artwork available as far as original artwork. So it's the first time ever we've had original artwork for Stealth Hammer to be available to people. So That's sweet. That is awesome. Yeah. yeah. That is awesome. Uh, and then we're going to have add-ons. So if you missed out in the past, like I said, issue, even if you pick up uh, a tier that doesn't have issue one and two in it, you can 
get issues one and two in the add-ons area. And you can get e you can get both coverage, you get either cover, whatever you want. Uh, we also have the bookmarks available. We have the prints. Uh, we also have uh, scripts uh, from the previous issues. So what I also do each uh, issue is there is, uh, it's for $60, you get the, you get the combo pack of both covers, you get the mini prints, five mini prints, you get a bookmark, you get a sticker sheet this time. And then uh, you get on top of that, you get the script and it's an annotated script. So basically you're getting the original script that I wrote out. And then I go in and add commentary and the margins of what I was trying to, what I was trying to do on a certain page, what, where the inspiration for something came from. It's just basically my free th thoughts that went onto every single page. And then uh, I signed that, I, we print it off on really nice paper uh, and put it in a nice uh, plastic so it, it doesn't get damaged. And I sign each one of them and that gets to go out. And so we have that not only available for this issue, but you can get issues one and two as well. Uh, the script as well. So That's if you're someone that likes behind the scenes uh, thought process and everything else, it's a great one for that. That's so, awesome, man. Yeah. And here's kind of all the details on it. Yeah. Let, you know, like what we, uh, what the time frames you can expect and where the money's going towards. And, and then at the very bottom there, I've been very blessed to have a lot of local uh, places uh, have me on to talk with them. I've had local uh, radio stations and news stations and everything else. I got to talk to one of my local heroes uh, who I watched growing up. His name was Leon Bibb and he's a local guy in Cleveland. And I watched him growing up. And also next thing I know, I'm sitting on a couch across from him talking about my comic books, which was that's just so a cool. very, very cool experience. So yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I mean, a lot of opportunities to jump in, a lot yeah. of opportunities to jump in. Um, I did the, the one where you get all three because I am new to your story and I cannot wait yeah. to dig in. Um, and it's extremely affordable too, Ryan, if you want to get in too, right? You obviously have yeah. more expensive stuff if you're a collector sure. and there's a lot of really cool things to do. But man, just to get in, it wasn't expensive at all. So I would, no. I would encourage everybody to jump in and look at all the rewards. Just something for everybody, I think. Yeah, and that that was very important to me. I always want to make sure that I'm making something affordable for people. Um, so like the the we start off with the, uh, you can start off with digitally just at $5. So you'll get the digital comic. Um, and then at $7, you can get the digital comic plus the physical copy of it. Yeah. Um, and then like the one you did, uh, it's $20 plus shipping. Uh, and that gets you all three issues yeah. with cover a and, uh, which is Joel's artwork, every single one of those, uh, which is always amazing to see. Um, so yeah, and then it just kind of just keeps going up from there. Uh, we have even the digital starter pack. So if someone likes their stuff digitally and they want all three issues, that's $15 and that's it. So yeah, we have the higher tier stuff and I'm hoping some people will love that type of stuff. Like you said, the collectors out there that love that type of stuff, but I want to make this accessible for people. It's important for me th to get the story out there. I just love telling this story is as fun as it, I, it has been for people that have told me they have had reading it it's so much fun for me to write it yeah. like all the kickstarter stuff is always the, the the headache the grind and everything else but like like being able to write these characters and and now they live so much in my head i know what they're i know how they're going to act like people always say like oh once a character becomes real like you they tell you where the story goes and i'm like okay and then sure enough i start telling the story i'm like well this character would do this if if you're in this situation so it may not have been where i thought they were going to go but that's where they're taking me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And that's that passion that, uh, you know, you want as a creator to come through on your comic. And that sounds like yeah. it I can't wait to read it. We'll stop share here. And, uh, um, but yeah, I'll make sure I post all the different links, one for your social, for the Kickstarter, for everything that you're doing, the website, all that good stuff. So that way people could find out more information and then follow you on all the different platforms. I know I, I found you on TikTok, on X, on yeah. Instagram, <laughs> on whatever their new Instagram one is, uh, what's it called? Um, that's uh -oh. all Instagram. They're kind of, yeah. Like, yeah. Knock off yeah. Like it's called. But yes, yeah, yeah. so you're everywhere, man. You're everywhere. Try, yeah. Trying to get the, yeah. Just trying to get it out there. And like, and I know we talked about this too. Like I've had people ask me like, well, so how far do you have this mapped out? Like how, where's this story going? And I'm like, because obviously as you could hear, like I, everything's put in there for a reason. There's a, there's a purpose behind it. And some things are going to matter later. Um, 
And, and you even see stuff like in the first page of the first issue, she has like I was mentioning her bedroom. There's a there's a sword hanging up in, hanging up in her bedroom. And issue two, we see on the cover who actually owns that sword. Now, we don't see yet how that all plays out, but there is a story involved with that. So. Um, so, yeah, I, like issue I two and three, like a, a prequel to issue one, like issue one is later on and you're going back to find out the whole story. Or is that so, how yeah. So issue two. Uh, so issue one is her getting her powers and everything else. Issue two is she gets introduced to Ari the elf and Ari the elf like tells the story of her family. Mm -hmm. And there's this, again, ridiculous two page spread from Joel uh, <laughs> where it's like this magical scroll that Ari lays out and there is so much on the page and it gives hints of things to come. Yeah. And uh, he, he packed it all in there. And, and I remember writing in the script saying like, here's, it'd be great if it had this and this and this and this. And then I put like, if you can't fit it all, that's okay. These are the important things. And he fit all of it in and more. Um, and like, just, it looks ridiculous, but it's basically she, in the second issue, it's still moving forward from the first issue, but now she's learning about her legacy and she's learning about her destiny and how she, she needs to become this guardian. Mm. And, uh, they're going to go on this trip to Iceland. And so on, when we get into issue three, uh, they're on this hover bike thing that she has that her dad invented, her dad's an inventor. Um, and they're riding it there. And rather than just have it be like, okay, now we're in Iceland, like, and tell the story from there, I wanted some type of passage of time. So she asks Ari to tell his story of like, how, how did you get here? And so he tells that story. Um, so there's that passage of the time. And we do end issue two with a cliffhanger. And my wife is very mad at me for that. Cause she's like, <laughs> you ended issue two with a cliffhanger and issue three does not resolve that cliffhanger. And I go, right. It'll be resolved in issue four. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, and the funniest thing is I've told her how it, what's going to happen. So she knows the story. Yeah. Yeah. She's still <laughs> mad at me because she's like, you left me feeling very uneasy at the end of issue two. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, good, because if you're feeling uneasy, I want the reader to feel uneasy. Yeah. And then and then we're gonna we'll resolve it in issue four. Don't worry. Yeah. But yeah, issue three is all this whole flashback. Uh so it's like you said, it's kind of a prequel to what we saw in issue one. And it leads into events that happened in issue one just from a different perspective, leading all the way up to him being introduced to the family. So uh it's everything you read from a different perspective with different things happening. And uh, you get to meet some of the characters again that you saw in the first couple issues, just in a different way. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Uh, and then we have, uh, I have issues uh, mapped out like almost page for page uh, planned out for issues four, five, and six. Nice. Um, and if my wife thought that issue three, uh, two ended with a cliffhanger, issue six really leaves with a cliffhanger. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but yeah, we, we find out some things, uh, that have been kind of hinted at all along. Um, so issue four is we get back to our main story. We get to a lot more adventure and action and everything else. Not that there's not action in this one, but the main stealth hammer action and everything and progressing that story. Issue five will be another flashback. Um, because in issue two, she was handed her grandmother's journal. Mm -hmm. um and that's also when she learned about her family legacy and she finds out that her her grandmother had superpowers um and her grandmother has disappeared in the last five years so she takes a moment while they're on this hero's quest it's one of those campfire scenes where she's going to sit down it's nighttime and she cracks open the, her grandmother's journal and she reads about one of her adventures and then we'll learn more about her family's history through the grandmother in that flashback and then issue six gets back with the story and like I said, we'll end with a really cool cliffhanger, a couple of cool cliffhangers. Um, so yeah. And I have it planned out for like mentally, I have probably enough ideas for like probably a good like 30 issues, uh, if not a little bit more. Um, but there's a definitive end, there's definitive plot points all along. Uh, I know like different beats that I want to hit and different characters that are gonna be introduced. Uh, but the first six issues are definitely very much mapped out. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, it sounds amazing. I cannot wait to get my copies and uh, dig in. Um, yeah. Man, I, I don't even know what else to ask, man. <laughs> <laughs> so we got the Kickstarter that ends in about 26 days. Um, when do um, backers, when do you think that they'll get their actual comic book? When, to, when do you think you'll be finished with all the artwork and ready to go to yeah. the good stuff? 
So the good thing is Joel's already working on more pages because he just he's just like, it's going to get done one way or another. We're going to get this done. So he's already working on more pages. We already have seven pages completed and the cover uh, and obviously variant cover and back cover are all done. So uh, he's going to work on at least a few more pages. So we'll have like half of almost half of the issue. It's a 22 page comic yeah. um, plus a couple pinups. Um, so the plan is that once it's funded that may and june he'll be he'll finish up the artwork we'll get it uh we'll be getting to the colorist during that time period as well so really the plan is to get it all to the letterer probably late june early july mm -hmm. uh dave is a beast when it comes to lettering he usually gets it done in like two three days oh, wow. um yeah it's crazy um and then he preps it for the printer and everything else and then we'll get it to the printer now the printer is where things slow down a little bit <laughs> because yeah. uh we are working while we're working with a, a company in the u.s uh they do print overseas they do negotiating like they uh like you would see for big companies so this way you can get the price pretty low um and they do remarkable good quality like i've had my comic shop owner say like this is better quality than i've seen on a lot of comics oh, yeah. um so it's it's really good quality really helps make the colors pop and everything else um but I asked them like, how long is it taking? They said it's taking about three and a half months right now. So, so if we get everything over to them in July, we're looking at probably like October is when we'll get everything back, maybe November, but that's when everything. So before Christmas is when everything should happen, should be getting out to people. But yeah, the plan is November is when everything will be shipped out to people. Beautiful, man. Beautiful. Yeah. Man. Well, awesome, man. Is anything else we're leaving out? I don't think so. Other than like, yeah, follow us on the different social medias. Uh, we try to do some fun things on there. Joel just recently like did a, a, a zoom in on like that first page that we looked at with the fairy on it. He showed like the artwork and he like panned back from it. And then he zoomed in and did like almost a where's Waldo. He was like going <laughs> back and forth on it and everything else. So if you want to see up close detail on it, check out our social media. That's um cool. No, I just I, I appreciate people checking it out and reading it. I think it's it. I think it's a fun story. Uh, I thankfully have had a lot of people uh, pay compliments that don't owe me anything. Like, uh, of course, we're trying to find publishers and things like that. And I've had, you know, it's tough with all ages uh, because it's not the most popular thing in the world. We are, you know, I'm trying to do even possibly like graphic novels, uh, pitches and stuff like that to companies that do specialize in all ages because graphic novels tend to be something that caters to the younger audience a lot better. Um, so we're looking at all that type of stuff. Cause I would like to tell, be able to tell the story a little bit quicker than what we're doing. Cause we're doing like usually an issue a year. Yeah. Um, and we have the capability of doing it faster. Um, but I've had publishers that reach out and they're just like, uh, we're going to pass on this. However, you know, you have something here, keep at it. Like, and again, they don't owe me that. They don't need yeah. to tell me that. Yeah. Um, I had a, a book publisher that said, we, I absolutely love this. It has a really great commercial feel to it, uh, which is what you want to hear from a book publisher. Um, they said, we're just, we're slam packed for the next three, four years. So we just can't take on new projects. And it's like, okay, that's fine. But again, these are people that like read what I sent them, did not, they could either not responded back or told me just no. Yeah. Um, but instead, they're telling me, like, you have something here to keep at it. Um, I just recently watched a video with a, care, a guy named uh, Q from uh, Impractical Jokers. Uh, and he said uh, when they pitched Impractical Jokers, the TV stations wanted it, but they wanted to do it without them because they were too they were too old and uh for an audience and stuff like that so they just kept shopping it around until finally someone said yeah let's do it and obviously it became a huge sensation and everything else right. <laughs> and he said i just learned that yeah. you you could have 50 pitches and they could say no 50 times and he says then you just move on to the 51st one yeah. and so that's kind of what we're doing we're just going to keep telling this story keep you know if we have to keep doing them through kickstarters we will um, but eventually someone's going to see it and, and have that opening to be able to do it. So again, it's, I've had other comic creators that are just like, yeah, don't let this go. You've, you've got something here. So keep working at it. So, so I hope people will give it a chance. I, I think that's all I'm asking people to do is like, even if you back it at the lowest level, just to check it out, I appreciate that immensely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's like I said, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but the artwork looks absolutely incredible. The story sounds super interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I understand 
all ages might be a little bit tough, but I think we need a lot more all ages. I feel like comic books in general, and again, I, I read those comic books and I love them. So this is not sure. a comic books at all, but they have gotten a lot more mature over the years. Yeah. Um, even superhero movies, right? A lot of the PG 13 don't do that well anymore, but the rated right. R ones do very well. So yeah. I feel like everybody wants something a little bit more gory, a little bit more mature. Yeah. Um, but we still need those all ages, yeah. um, you know, to get people into comic books. And, and it can't, the first one can't be a Deadpool. Um, right. <laughs> right. I mean, you, know, you want your eight year old to kind of ease into comic books and yeah. when, like they have the right maturity level, then they could get into some of the other stuff. But, you know, if we all go in that direction, how do we get newer, younger children? Right. And that's why they're going to dog man and manga right. and stuff like that, because they do that really well. Yeah. So I think you're onto something, Ryan. And I hope that uh, more and more all ages type stuff does come out um, because I think it, there's a, a place for that. And I think we've walked away from that maybe a little too soon. Yeah, I agree. And like you said, I love all that, the mature stuff and everything. I, I There's titles out there that are just, blowing my mind right now yeah, I, mean, I got spawn right here yeah I, mean, I love all that stuff man yeah like there's the i don't want my eight-year-old watching it though. right right <laughs> Espe but like especially like the stuff i grew up with like and i do the podcast for like the energon universe stuff is amazing right now so, um like just blows my mind and then you you have all these other independent stuff coming out and it's it's just incredible but yeah i i wanted to do something where it's like i would not be afraid to hand this to anyone of any age I've had someone at age uh, eight years old read it, and I've had someone at age 95 years old read it, <laughs> and like, and everywhere in between. Yeah. Um, so it, it, I wanted it, I didn't want to talk down to kids yeah. um, with the storytelling, but at the same time, I wanted it to be accessible for them. So I wanted something where they could have fun, even if they're just looking at the artwork or something like that. And you mentioned manga, like I know manga is huge. And if you notice with Joel's artwork, it's got a little bit of a manga influence to it. Uh, so hopefully it'll appeal to uh, people. But I had a, a old coworker of mine. This is a, a fun last story we can close on. Is um, she was a little concerned about you know like, hey, is your comic appropriate for for my son? Uh, and I said, oh, absolutely. And so she came to a, a comic convention and bought the issue. And her, she her son was just getting into superheroes and everything else. And then she sent me a message days later and she said, I was walking past his room and he was laughing. And she goes, and I went into his room and said, what are you laughing at? And he was reading the comic and he was reading a part with Ari the Elf that was very humorous and it just cracked him up to the point <laughs> he was literally laughing out loud. That's and awesome. I was like, you just made my entire day. Like that moment is that's what I do it for is like, I want to tell a story that someone's enjoying it that much that they're literally having an out loud reaction to it. So. Yeah. Congratulations. I mean, yeah, you know, your audience. And I think that's also very important yeah. and uh, man, it looks amazing. I cannot wait to get, get my hands on it, Ryan, yeah. and get out for myself. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a little, I think we're about the same age, I assume, but uh, yeah. Um, you know, I have a, my first grandchild, so now I got to prepare to get <laughs> more appropriate. That way, we could get him into it, man. That way I Absolutely. Have, no, no, I have four kids, and none of them like comic books, man. <laughs> so my my uh, my nieces and nephews got in, uh, indoctrinated because I came into their lives, and uh, one of go. them uh, one of them actually said when he was a kid, he said, uh, "Hey, mom, I'm gonna I, I like comic books and I like superheroes," and she's like, "Oh, that's nice," and he goes. And when I get to be an adult, I'm going to like superheroes and comic books also because Uncle Ryan's an adult and he likes that stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wish my wife had that kind of attitude, man. She just looks at me and goes, ah, I married a 12 year old man. He's never yeah. aged. He's like, what is that movie where he never ages? Tom, yes. Tom but, <laughs> but you know what? It's OK, because my wife also pointed out, she goes, you could be doing worse things. You could be at yes. the bar every night. You could be, you know, uh, she's you know, she she's like it. She goes, I might not understand it, but she goes, there's far worse things you could be doing. So <laughs> I would hope so. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So uh, she goes, yeah, if the, if the word I mean, think about it, like all this, the values and stuff like that, at least for me came from like reading these heroes and everything else like life like truly life values and everything else and that that was another thing with the whole like creating my character like she's she doesn't give up like she's got that spider-man thing to her where she like i said she's got that tagline of you know that's not how the story ends like she just has that never give up attitude i had somebody that read it that didn't uh she she said the character's a little too perky for me she's a little too uh 
positive okay. attitude and upbeat and everything else. And I said, don't worry. Yeah. She gets knocked down a few pegs, but the whole idea behind her is she doesn't give up. And so she's not always going to be the one that wins. She's not going to be the one that comes out on top. She has to go through this hero's quest. I said, I wanted a character that started off like super positive. Everything's going to go my way. And she, she even comes from a family that's like that and everything else. And then we're going to, we'll put her through the ringer. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> that's how you make a better hero. Like you make yeah. a better hero by like putting them through trials and having them face off against opponents that seem insurmountable and everything else. And, but they, they always find a way. And that's always been, that's always been my way in life too. It's like, uh, there's a quote I have literally sitting on my desk that's uh, from Walt Disney that says it's kind of fun to do the impossible. Yeah. Um, you know, that for me, that's always like when someone says, well, you're not gonna be able to do this. it would be like, okay, watch me. So, <laughs> so, um, last question, Ryan, um, how are like comic cons for you? Are you doing several comic cons? Do you kind of stay in like the Ohio area or do you find yourself traveling a little bit? Like where can so, you find you? So this, uh, so this year I'm not traveling much at all. I don't have any conventions lined up. Uh, I'm doing a, a couple like local things. Um, uh, I do plan on branching out in the years ahead and, okay. and kind of probably mostly road trip type stuff. Cause it does get expensive to do conventions. Um, and when you're adding hotel and everything on top of it, it gets very expensive. Um, and I'm not the artist, so I can't like make my money back through commissions. I literally am selling the comic and, and some swag stuff that we have and that's it. So I do plan on doing some conventions. One thing that I'm doing right now uh, this year that is very interesting and I, am, I have been local with it, but I'm certainly looking to branch out a bit is I've been uh, doing presentations about storytelling and comic book creation. Oh, that's cool. uh, to kids. So I actually did a presentation at a middle school recently. Uh, it was 800 kids, uh, which was very intimidating, <laughs> but I do like public speaking and I do enjoy presenting stuff. So they, they split it up into two groups of 400 for me though. So don't worry. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> um, 400 is still pretty intimidating. Yeah. yeah it's still intimidating. Um, but I, the kids loved it. Like we, yeah. it was, I kept it interactive and it's, it's inter to what we were talking about earlier. It's introducing kids into com the world of comics and everything else. And it was interesting too, because they split it up into uh, fifth and sixth graders and seventh and eighth graders. And I opened up each one by saying like who likes superhero movies and like uh Mar the Marvel movies and the DC movies and stuff like that. And the fifth and sixth grade, like almost all of them raised their hands. And I was like, okay, and how many of you like reading comic books or manga? Yeah. And about at least half of them kept their hands up. Then you get to the seventh and eighth graders, and it was like half the room raised their hand for liking superheroes and like five of them raised their hand for liking comic books and manga. Cause it's just as seventh and eighth graders, it's not cool to like that stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, don't worry, you're going to change. You're going to find out really quick that that stuff does not matter to how cool you look and everything anymore. Um, but they, but they still got into the presentation. Like they still like were interacting with me. And when I started asking for ideas and everything else, like, cause one of the things I do is I have them give me, uh, once I do the presentation, talk about how you create characters and how comics are created and stuff like that, I have them help me create a character. So I have them like give me superpowers and give me personality types and an origin and a superhero name. And they all wanted to raise their hands. They all wanted to be involved in, in stuff. And then what I do is I go home and I write a story based off of that, like just a paragraph or two. It's like a little writer's challenge. Like, can I take someone else's idea and make a story with it? Um, and then I sent it back to the school and the school would read it. So I'm also doing... Um, presentation at our local at a local library here on the 30th uh to talk do the same presentation they said well how many people you want to limit it to and i was like well i just presented to 400 kids and they're like well you're not going to get that number here and i was like that then we're fine don't worry about it <laughs> um so i'm presenting on the 30th uh and then i'll be presenting uh that's in uh westlake ohio uh westlake public library and then in august i'm going to be presenting in my hometown of strongsville at our lo local library so all of a sudden out of this came like a public speaking career, uh, which is totally fine. But it's it's again, it's getting it out there to the to the kids and getting them to enjoy it. And hopefully, like I'll have stuff up about, you know, the the comic and everything else. And if parents are interested, they can they can pick up the comic for their kids and stuff like that. So um, but I would love to do more of that type of stuff and get the be that type of ambassador for comic book creation and everything else and comic book reading. So well, that's awesome, Ryan, man. You're helping out uh, the comic industry because uh, I do think 
one of the the items that comics is struggling with is new readership. Yeah. Uh, you walk into a comic book store, they all look like me. You know, they're all yeah. between yep. 50 and 60 years old and we're all looking for yeah. issues and <laughs> what variants we like. And we're arguing about Robert Liefeld's newest uh, <laughs> uh, cover that he did. I mean, it's yeah. ridiculous, right? But there's no oh, yeah. teenagers in that comic book shop. No. Well, <laughs> so, and that's the thing too. I have a, a local comic shop here. It's called Carolyn John's Comic Shop. And they're pretty actually well known across the, the country, but he gets very involved in the community. Yeah. He uh, donates comics to the local libraries and everything else. And he has carried Stealth Hammer uh, every, every issue. In fact, issue one, I think sold like over a hundred copies at his shop, which... Wow there's Marvel and DC titles that don't do that. So, yeah. um, so he, he's making sure that like you have local creators and indie creators that are getting the attention and getting, um, and like we said, this comic's accessible for kids. So he's getting it into kids' hands and uh, parents' hands to give to their kids and things like that. He throws a huge uh, thing for free comic book day every year. Um, he gets anywhere from two to 3000 people that come out for it. So, um, so he's doing his part too. So like, when I see someone doing that, like, like I said, it makes me want to do what I'm doing now too, to kind of get it out there and kind of show that this is a very valid form of storytelling, especially nowadays, like we were talking about, it's way more accepted now than it ever was before yeah. because of all the movies and TV shows and everything else that are out there. Uh, it's not that fringe outskirts type thing anymore. Now it's, it's very mainstream. So if I can get people reading the source material and showing them like there's these amazing stories like you you love into the spider verse you should read the actual spider verse story because it's like one of the best spider-man stories i've ever read so like making those connections and everything else um like i mentioned before green lantern my favorite character like the jeff johns run of green lantern is like mind-blowing yeah um and so like it's my favorite too yeah and it's it's one of those things where it's just like if you can find out what somebody likes uh, you can, they don't, it doesn't have to be superheroes. Um, you know, uh, that's the nice thing with my story too. It's, it's, you got fantasy in there, you got, uh, sci-fi in there. You just happen to have your main character's a superhero, but you know, she's a superhero of a different type and she's in this world that isn't just necessarily like people flying around and running around and everything else. So it's, it's a little bit different for that reason. But like, I've introduced people to books like fables, yeah. You know, which is great for people that aren't typically your superhero uh, comic book reader. Um, you know, and then there's stuff out there like a friend of mine, I got him into Stray Dogs and Feral is out there now and stuff like that. And he's he's loving that. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's it, there's just some that truly is something out there for everybody. And it's just a matter of finding it. And I love helping people find those things. Doing the podcast, I've had so many people and you've probably run into this, too, where they they blame me for getting them hooked on comics again. <laughs> That's the point. That's and the I point. will wear that like a badge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I just love comic books, man. So talking about comic books and, and showing the positive side, there's certainly negative in every industry. I don't care what industry you work yeah. in. There's going to be negative and there's going to be positive. Um, and in comic books, it's no different, but I like to focus on the positive that's happening. Yeah. Um, there's so many good things that are going on in comic books, specifically on the independent side. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't, like you said, whatever you're into, there's an independent comic for you. I guarantee yeah. it. It's just, they're not as available in comic book shops. So you're probably yeah. not going to find a lot of them there, but man, you just go through Kickstarter. I, I consider that my second LCS, oh, yeah. my Wednesday stop. And I, you know, Ambrose is the owner over there. He's a good friend of mine. And yeah. I spend three hours in there just arguing yeah. over dumb stuff that means nothing. <laughs> um, and I pick up my comics and I wait till the next week. But then I go on Kickstarter and I just kind of thumb through going, oh, that looks cool. That looks cool. And then I make my purchases there, too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. I totally I totally get that. And that's the thing, too. Like you said, I, I try not I try to stay out of all the politics of it and everything else, like all the comic skate stuff and all that. Like. I'm trying to tell a story that people will enjoy. And that's at the end of the day, that's all I'm trying to do. I've had people that interview me. They're like, well, your, your hero is a, is a, is a woman. Like, are you trying to do like a feminist spin or something like that? And I said, my hero is a woman because it's based off my wife. And if so, like if my, if I was gay and I was married to a guy, then my hero would probably be a gay man. Like that's, it's, it's, that's where I got my inspiration was my wife. And that's why it is. Now, that being said, if someone picks up on it picks it up and reads it and they're like i love this this female character she gives me women empowerment and stuff like that fantastic i love that 
the you, awesome I, byproduct of my story. Right, <laughs> right. A good story should mean that you get something out of it for you. And, and that's what I'm hoping for is that I'm hoping I'm telling a good story that people enjoy and they get something out of it personal for themselves. So 100%, yeah, I don't care what your politics are. I don't care about any of that. I just yeah. want a really good story that I can enjoy. And that's yeah. it. That's yeah. it. Man. That's all I care. That's all I care about. I don't care where it comes from. Just I love really good stories, man. So exactly. Comic books. And there's too much division um in our world outside of comics. I hate to see it in comics, but you know, people are yeah. people. But boy, man, there's a lot to be um thankful for in comics right now if you really look. Yeah. I think. And Absolutely. So in those areas. Absolutely. And I'm just hoping I'm contributing to that. So <laughs> you are, Ryan. I think you are. And again, I haven't read it yet. So sure wait to get my hands on it yeah but yeah you man uh yeah. but it looks absolutely fabulous and i encourage anybody watching this to get over to kickstarter 20 uh what 24 days left yeah if i'm not mistaken plenty of time to jump in and for 20 bucks you get the entire story up to this point you can't beat that price man yeah that's, yeah. that's crazy prices right there yeah and that's just researching and finding a good printer that could keep the cost down for us and everything else and which is hard yeah. to, do, to be honest it's very hard to do but yeah hard we've been do. successful so far and like you said and that does not diminish the quality like i said the quality of the comic uh it it, it feels good in your hands so it's not the not to bash any any companies out there but i know there was a lot of complaints there for a while where marvel was having the the comics that were like you'd hold them up and they just kind of fell over <laughs> It's not that it's not that it's uh, it, it's probably as close to being like almost a cardstock without being a cardstock. So it's still paper, but it's uh, it's got a nice feel to it. And like I said, that helps bring out the colors and the and the artwork and really helps it make make it pop. So beautiful, Ryan. Well, Ryan, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you uh, coming on the podcast is absolute pleasure meeting you and getting to talk to you and uh, see this passion come through your comic book and even all the background with your wife and how the story came about very very cool project and i can't wait to get my hands on it we'll make sure we put all the links below that way you could follow uh ryan at uh, steam uh, stealth hammer on all platforms stealthhammer.com on your website um and then obviously we'll put the kickstarter link down there but really if you just go to kickstarter and type in stealth hammer it pops right up this is i think your third kickstarter yeah. uh, maybe more i don't know but that's i think i saw three so yeah. it's gonna be there you're gonna find it very easily if you just type that in but congratulations on the first two um three looks like it's awesome uh ryan thank you so much man appreciate you thank you so much it was a pleasure talking with you i have watched a lot of your shows and and but it's always more fun when you get to actually interact versus just yeah. like talking to someone that can't hear you so yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, it's the pleasure always welcome ryan um no problem and maybe we could have you back on and we could just talk comics uh, on another episode man that would be awesome i would love that maybe a little green lantern man That'd yes awesome. absolutely <laughs> all right ryan i uh hope you have an amazing uh weekend and we'll talk soon okay sounds good thank you all right thank you bye-bye